Uh, well, listen, I gotta, we, it's going to be a special night. I've got to talk. The, the title for tonight's talk is I Will Do the Opposite. I Will Do the Opposite. And it's an Anchor 5 talk, and if we can get Anchor 5 up on the screen, it says, get honest, honest, everybody say honest, about my past so I can discover God's best version of me. Really look at the word honest. To see and be and to live out God's best version of you requires that you get brutally honest about your past and see how all the events in your life shaped you into the person you are today, good and bad. So let me ask you a couple of softball, I'll throw you some lob questions to sort of get you ready for tonight's talk. What secret from your past is still making you sick? What event from your past are you still not willing to deal with and allow God to heal you of? I told you, they're easy questions, okay? <laughs> what trauma from your past have you been stuffing inside of you, hoping that one day the pain will go away? What part of your past is still unresolved with no closure? Is it the one thing, the one secret that you've never been able to tell anybody, not even anyone here at Encounter or any one of your groups, that still lives inside of you, growing inside of you like an emotional cancer that is fueled and filled with guilt, regrets, shame, that's keeping you in denial? Are you still keeping a record of all your regrets, even though God has cleared your record of guilt? Which is why our signature scripture for Anchor 5 is found in Psalm 32, 2. It says, yes, what joy. Everybody say joy. 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 For those whose record the Lord has cleared, notice it says guilt, not sin. Because when God forgives you of your sin, he takes care of your guilt as well too. Whose lives are lived in complete, everybody say it. Honesty, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. Psalm 32, 2, David. See, if you're not able to say with conviction, with conviction, the Lord has cleared my record of guilt, you're still carrying that guilt. Guilt will lead you down a sick cycle of denial and insanity, doing the same things over and over again, expecting a different result. And I just want to suggest to you, maybe it's time to do something different. Maybe it's time to do something the opposite of what you've been doing. Maybe it's time for you to sort of have a moment like George Costanza did on an episode of Seinfeld. Check this out. Yeah. I went to the beach. Oh, the beach. <laughs> it's not working, Jerry. It's just not working. What is it that isn't working? Why did it all turn out like this for me? I had so much promise. <laughs> I was personable. I was bright. Oh, maybe not academically speaking, but <laughs> I was perceptive. I always know when someone's uncomfortable at a party. They're not going over there? It all became very clear to me sitting out there today that every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. <laughs> my life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of life, be it something to wear, something to eat, it's all been wrong. <laughs> Tuna on toast, coleslaw, cup of coffee. Yeah. No, 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 wait a minute. I always have tuna on toast. Nothing's ever worked out for me with tuna on toast. <laughs> I want the complete opposite of tuna on toast. Chicken salad on rye. <laughs> Untoasted with a side of potato salad. And a cup of tea. <laughs> well, there's no telling what can happen from this. You know, chicken salad's not the opposite of tuna. Salmon's the opposite of tuna, because salmon swim against the current, and the tuna swim with it. Good for the tuna. Uh, George, you know, that woman just looked at you. So what? What am I supposed to do? Go talk to her. Elaine 
bald men with no jobs and no money who live with their parents <laughs> don't approach strange women. Well, here's your chance to try the opposite. Instead of tuna salad and being intimidated by women, chicken salad and going right up to them. Yeah, I should do the opposite. I should. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. <laughs> yes. I will do the opposite. I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Excuse me, uh, I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. <laughs> oh, yes, I was. You just ordered the same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. I'm Victoria. Hi. <laughs> Of course, you know the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, right? So to experience something great and miraculous in your life, you probably have to do something opposite of what you normally do, right? You have to do the opposite of what your natural instincts are, what your old nature, what your sin nature wants to do, what your old self wants to do, what you have been programmed to do for so many years of coping and dealing with all the events in your life that shaped you into the person you are today. You have to do something that's the opposite of what you would normally do because if what you normally did worked, you would be able to change. But you can't change, and what you normally did and does doesn't work. So it makes sense to do the opposite of what you normally do. Now, when I talk about doing the opposite, I'm talking about doing something so countercultural and so opposite of what society and even what most churches are selling these days. Some of those opposite choices include living out these 12 anchors of hope radically in your life. Living them out day by day, every day. Praying. How about this? Praying with complete honesty and surrender radically trusting God in every area of your life and giving him access to every part of your life and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you into truth so that you can see through the lens of God how you became the person you are today and be transformed into, into the person God wants you to be. That would be doing something opposite, wouldn't it? That's radical. You see, I gave my life to Jesus Christ about 20 years ago when I was 37 years old. But I had the social skills of a young, immature teenager. I never grew emotionally beyond my hurts. I never grew beyond the hurt of a sexual assault that occurred to me uh, when I was 12 years old. My confusion and hurt grew into shame, and that shame grew into anger. To cope with that anger, I drank whatever I get my hands on, I did whatever drugs I could take, and I had sex whatever with as many girls as I could possibly have who would ever sleep with me. I grew up without the physical touch of a dad. I never saw my dad. My dad left before I was one years old. And when I combine all of that with the sexual assault and all the things that happened to me when I was a kid, that just added to my hurt and confusion and made me even more angry. I acted out in ways that were hurtful to me and others, especially the ones I loved the most. And I didn't realize I had deep, deep abandonment issues until later in life. I basically was a train wreck, and my life was a mess. Now, when I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ and decided to, to follow Jesus, I always say I'm a follower of Christ. I'm going to talk about that at the end, what it means to be a follower of Christ. I had to go all in. I had to allow God to transform my life. I had to allow God to change me from the inside out. I knew I had to do something that was the complete opposite of all my instincts, of everything that I ever did in order for me to be healed and transformed and changed and for God to restore my marriage. But by applying the principles of Anchor 5 to my life, I was able to connect the dots and see where people and events in my life contributed to who Bill Reeser was. And as I prayed, and as I allowed the Holy Spirit to search my heart and reveal things in me, I started writing. 
And when I started writing, I started writing, who did things to me? Who were they? I started listing names. I started writing what they did to me, how those events made me feel, how I coped with my feelings, how I dealt with my pain, how I became this and that. And then I started listing what character defects, what compulsions, what relational issues, what strongholds developed in my life as a result of every single event in my life, good and bad. Guilt-ridden people will only concentrate on the bad. You have to combine the good, otherwise you'll give up on a process like this, and you'll give up on God searching you and revealing the things he needs to bring to the light so he can heal it once and for all and set you free in Jesus' name. It was then that I can clearly see of how I actually, how Bill Reeser became the person he was and how, why I, I did the things I did for so many years. I'm telling you, doing this spiritual exercise and journey with the Holy Spirit, it not only changed my life, but here's what it did. It revealed the root issues in my life. Not the symptoms, that's majoring in the minors. I'm talking about the root issues in my life. And when God ripped out the root issues in my life, I saw God in a different light. Oh, man. And for the first time in my life, I saw myself how God sees me. I was able to look at myself in the mirror through the lens of God. And for the first time, I could see myself as a person that was loved. It was God's best version of me. It was God's best plan for me. It was God's best identity for me. See, guilt told me I always did the wrong thing. Shame told me I was the wrong thing. Guilt held me hostage to my actions. Shame held me hostage to a false identity. Before Christ, the devil convinced me that I was unlovable and unredeemable. Anybody hear those words? Anybody hear that lie? But God exposed those lies and declared me not guilty. And I learned that God's plan for me included a better version of me than the one that the devil was selling me. God gave me a Holy Spirit makeover, and I'm loving it, as Kramer says. I'm loving it. See, my story began with my earthly father abandoning me. I never felt the touch of, and the love and the nurturing of a physical father. You see, but my story has become his story. My story has become about my father in heaven's story, how he likes to rewrite his story in a person. See, here's what God does. He takes your junk, he takes your pain, he takes your shame, he recycles it, and he makes you a trophy of his grace and says, here, how do you like that? Boom, there goes the dynamite. That's what God does. That's what he does. You see, my past is now my past. I don't live in the past. My future is in Christ. And I'm going to forever live my life in gratitude and thanks to the King of Kings and the one who set me free. So for the rest of the night, for the rest of the night, I want to talk to you about doing the opposite of what you normally feel like doing so you can see, maybe for the first time, who you really are in Christ and how you became the person you are today, but discover God's best version of you for tomorrow. First of all, applying these countercultural biblical anchors would be the opposite of what anybody would normally do. Living out anchor one and two is the opposite of playing God and not believing that God's love and power can restore hope and healing. That really is the opposite. By making the decision to respond to the love of God and surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, you always hear me say this, a real transaction occurs. The old is gone, the new has come. And you are no longer the same person that you used to be. You see, that would be the opposite of trusting in yourself. You see, you trusted when you applied these anchors to your life. You trusted and you continue to trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. You're made new. You're given a new identity. That would be the opposite of how you see yourself. It would be the opposite. In return, God declared you not guilty. 
He declared once and for all that you are forgiven, and now you have an eternal home in heaven. All those thoughts, all those truths, are typically, for most of us, the opposite of how you think about yourself, how you think about your future. And that's what happens when you apply the first four anchors to your life. And if you allow them to do so, God will take all that junk, all that muck, all that stuff that weighs you down, and he'll make you new. That's what he does. He makes things new. But here's what you have to do. You got to do an evaluation. You got to go on a journey of your past. But you're not going to do it alone. The Holy Spirit's going to do it for you. And you have to look at the events and the people and everything that happened in your life. And you have to see and you have to write it down. And you have to do this. You have to evaluate how everything impacted your life, how your character defects were developed, how your coping mechanisms were developed how your fears, insecurities, pain, even good habits, not just bad habits, how strongholds were developed, how you were shaped into the person you are today so that you can finally allow God to heal you, here it is, of the root issues of your life. The fifth anchor of hope is all about getting gut-level honest with both yourself and God and trusted people in your life. It really is, for many of us, doing the opposite of what our natural instincts are. Now, to help you recognize how you became the person you are today and discover God's best version of you moving forward, Anchor 5 requires a couple of things, and if you're taking notes down, you may want to write these things down. First of all, it requires that you have the right mindset. You've got to have the right mindset. Paul talks about set your mind on things above. You see, to have the right mindset means that you recognize and you agree with God on the thoughts that he wants you to dwell on, on the priorities, the thoughts, the promises in his word, that you dwell on everything that's in this book that he wants you to live out in your own life. That's having the right mindset. Not you acting out of your fears or your insecurities. He says, you've got to have the right mindset. You don't have to understand everything. You don't have to have a, a million scriptures memorized. But whatever you read, you have to say, that's me. I'll do that. Never heard that before, never read that before, but I'll do it. That's having the right mindset. No one's ever taught that to me before, but you can count me in. That's having the right mindset. Number two is having the right attitude. You gotta have the right attitude, which means you humbly allow God to evaluate your thoughts and guide your actions by completely surrendering to him and his word. You gotta have the right attitude. You gotta have the right mindset. You gotta have the right attitude. Third, you gotta have the right motive. Motive. God, get me well so she will notice. That's not the right motive. Get me better. For this and for that. You gotta have the right motive. The Bible says you have not because you ask not, because when you ask, you don't ask with the right motives. You gotta have the right motives. You know what the right motive is? It's a deep desire that no matter what's going on in your life, that no matter what's surrounding you, no matter what's pressing in on you, that your motive is you have a deep desire to love God back. You have a deep desire to live a life of gratitude for what He's done for you. You have a deep desire to follow God in every area of your life. You don't bargain with God. You don't make deals with God. Your motive for everything that you do is, I just love you, Lord, because you love me first. And I can never outlove you, but I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you by trying to live for you. I'm going I'm to study your word. I'm going to obey your command. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. It's just a deep desire to love God back. That's got to be your motive. Four, have the right spirit of complete honesty. Everybody say honesty. Allow the Holy Spirit to search me as I get gut level honest and real with myself and God. It's written by Joel, not the book of Joel, Billy Joel. Uh, he said this, he wrote a song called Honesty. And he said this, honesty is such a lonely word. 
everyone is so untrue. Honesty is hardly ever heard and mostly what I need from you. That's good. Do you ever stop and think how different we would all act if we were just brutally honest with one another? Just imagine if a pastor was brutally honest. What would that look like? Well, I found one. Check this out. digress for a moment from my prepared message. I mean it when I say to you, you guys, sometimes you're bad. Don't be jerks. You're supposed to be good. I'm in my office every day and somebody comes in and they're like, hey, whoops. I'm like, don't. Dan, what is your deal? If anybody doesn't know, Dan is the worst. I took a vow to not say who was the worst, but it's Dan. You guys are making me look bad in front of God. What's that? Oh, look, it's Jesus. And he said, stop it. The word of the Lord. I've never felt those feelings before. <laughs> so listen, now that you're aware that you need to have the right mindset, the right attitude, the right motive, and the right spirit of honesty, everybody say honesty, to discover God's best version of you, it's important to read some certain scriptures that will sort of validate where your heart is. And I, 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 I've, in, the, in the lesson, I've listed a bunch of scriptures. I'm going to go over some of them with you. The first one is, and this is probably one of my favorite, is Psalm 119. It's the longest psalm, okay? If you're looking for it, it's right after Psalm 118. And, uh, and, and the reason why I have you read Psalm 119 in its entirety is because when you read it, and you read it slowly, and you read it in its entirety, you're asking God to give you that same heart and passion, and reading it will let you know if you have the right mindset, attitude, motive, and honesty. And if for any part of that psalm that you read that you, that you don't agree with it, that you don't have the right mindset, attitude, motive, and honesty, you're probably not ready for an exercise like this with the Holy Spirit. And so that's a really good test for you to read that and say, does this reflect where my heart is? Does this reflect my love for God? Does this reflect how I want to live my life and leave the legacy behind that I know God's called me to do? I want you to read Proverbs 5, 21 and realize that God knows everything about you anyway. It says this, for your ways are in full view of the Lord. I know a lot of us go through life thinking, hope God doesn't see this. And he examines all your paths. I want you to read Isaiah 43, 25, 26 to help you get honest about your past. Here's what God says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Isn't that a great verse? Review the past for me, God says. Let's argue the matter together. State the case for your innocence. After you read that, Check your heart, check your motives, check your attitude with that. Read Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. It's a living Bible translation. And ask God to search every part of you through his word and his Holy Spirit by reading this passage. And it says this, for whatever God says to us is full of living power. It is sharper than the sharpest dagger, cutting swift and deep into our innermost thoughts and desires with all their parts exposing us for what we really are. He knows about everyone, everywhere. Everything about us is bare and wide open to the all-seeing eyes of our living God. Nothing, nothing in your past, nothing that you've done 
can be hidden from him to whom we must explain all we have done. You see, I, when you read something like that, depending on where your heart is, it's either going to make you miserable and angry or it's going to bring great joy to you. It's a great test. You should also read Psalm 51 as a prayer of repentance. I don't have it here. I just threw that in as a bonus. But there, if you want, to look, you want to see what real repentance looks like, read Psalm 51. Read, and, and you know when you read these, read, read Psalm 139. Read it, especially the first 18 verses. And that will remind you of God's great love for you and how he thinks about you. And then go on to verses 23 and 24. And here's where I want to camp out for a few minutes. I want you to pray this prayer, verses 23 and 24, as a prayer of complete humility and honesty before God. And I will tell you that if you pray this prayer with humility and honesty before God, the Holy Spirit will show you things about you and your life you've never, ever have dreamed up. David had a word for me, and the word was from Jeremiah 33, 3, for the, today's service, call to me, and I will show you unsearchable things you don't even know of. That'd be a great place to put that scripture. But here's what verse 23 and 24 says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. Don't miss the four things in the prayer. Search me. Everybody say search me. And know my heart. Second one is test me. And know my anxious thoughts. Third one, point out anything in me that offends you. And four, lead me. Lead me along your path. Not my path. And if you allow the Holy Spirit to search, test, point, and lead, S-T-P-L, your life, then Anchor 5 can bring you to a place where you could, you could finally, once and for all, be free from your past. And you can experience healing at the highest level. See, the lesson in Anchor 5, in the study, and you can go to our website, you can go to our phone app, there's an in-depth lesson on this. We'll show you how to pray these two simple verses for every part of your reflective journey. Just like I shared with you earlier, who did what to me? What did they do? How did they make me feel? How did I cope? What came about those events? What compulsions? What strongholds? What habits? What hang-ups? All these things. If you do those things, praying that simple prayer... Those four things, search, test, point, and lead. You're going to have a great, great sort of roadmap of what God wants to do for you for the rest of your life, of how he wants to heal you and set you free. It's a spiritual inventory. You know, when I, my first job out of college, I worked for a frozen food company in New York City. It was a crazy job. And uh, we, had, uh, we had frozen food that we sold to major companies, and we stored it in a freezer the size of a football field. That's how big it was, huge. A couple times a year, we would have to do inventory. And we, have to, we would have to count every box and every bag, and it would take us an entire day with about 50 or so people. And it was just, it was just tedious. And every single one of those inventories, it would be virtually impossible to get an accurate that was a beef stew that just came out. You see that? It was an accurate inventory. But Bob, great beef stew tonight. It would be impossible to get an accurate inventory just because of human error. Hey, I'm real. What you see is what you get. I don't care. Tourette's comes out at any point. Okay. Uh, if we were 97% accurate, that would be considered a successful inventory. It would be. But it would be impossible to do 100% accurate inventory. For a company, you can live with that. You really could. But when it comes to you doing a personal inventory and evaluating your life, a 97% accurate inventory could tear you down. See, all the devil needs is 1%, 2%, 3% of your life that you keep off limits to God where he just has a little crack in the door 
to come back in. It's, the, it's that one little thing you don't ever want to deal with. It's that one little thing you never want to confess. It's that one little thing you never want to tell anybody. It's that one little thing that you want to keep inside of you the rest of your life. That's all the devil needs to keep you stuck in bondage for the rest of your life. I have met hundreds. I've been teaching recovery stuff in churches for the last 11 years and walking with people for the past 20 years, and I have met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who have done an inventory, a spiritual inventory, a personal inventory. And that's the problem. They did the inventory. Well, I just did an inventory. Well, great, we'll get you a job at Home Depot. You see, I always know when God's going to do the inventory or when someone's going to do it. See, when I've done this, I've done inventories like this. When I do it, I come out smelling peachy because I leave out that one little thing, that, those two little things I don't want to talk about. But when you allow the Holy Spirit, see, that's the difference. You can either do the inventory or you allow the Holy Spirit to do it for you. And when you allow the Holy Spirit to do your inventory... When you allow the Holy Spirit to do the work for you, to talk to you, to speak to you, to reveal things to you, to point out things in you, to lead you, it's going to be 100% accurate, and you're going to be 100% guaranteed whole and healed in Jesus' name. So what's holding you back? What's keeping you stuck? See, that encounter when you apply the fifth anchor to your life, it's nothing that you do. You don't apply it to your life. It's all him. It's all Holy Spirit. And you can be free once and for all. God can take every ounce of pain. He can take all your shame. He can get you out of the city of regrets. Move you to a place of joy, purpose, and freedom. It is God's best version of you. Trust me, when you get this Holy Spirit makeover... Maybe one day, too, you'll say, I'm loving it. And that's what God wants. God wants to make you his redeemed masterpiece. Because that's who you are. That's who you are. Can you see it? God sees it. I see it. I can see you through the eyes of God. You know why? Because I've been forgiven. And those who have been forgiven, they love much. And when you love much and see people through the eyes of God, you can love them with his heart. You can't change your past, but you can't be free from your past. You can't change all the things that were done to you, and you may never forget. You don't try and change so you can forget. You try and change so that you can be set free. See, the Holy Spirit sort of has a divine way of bringing light into every crevice of your life, exposing everything that lurked in the darkness, that held you captive in your thoughts and in your behavior. And God can help you see things for what they really are and reveal to you the havoc that they've caused in your life, in your relationships with God and with other people, which, by the way, are the two root causes for every problem in your life. Your broken relationships with God and your broken relationships with other people. Do this, allow the Holy Spirit to take you on this journey and heal the root issues of those broken relationships. You'll be so set free, the world won't know what to do with you. <laughs> God wants to break your chains. It really is that simple. God wants to break the chains in your life. So why are you walking around with a ball and chain all this time? When God wants to break those chains and free you from it. God wants to restore what the enemy has stolen. God wants to replace your regrets with a hope for the future. God wants you to discover his best version of you as you experience his great exchange program. See, he exchanges your life for his. He exchanges your shame for his son. He exchanges your guilt with his grace, your pain with his power, your hurts with his healing, your identity with his identity. He takes your old nature, he exchanges your old nature with his new nature, and he exchanges your hopelessness with his eternal hope. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. Because that's really all I got to say tonight. That's it. And, but here's the question I want to leave with you. And it's a thought. Notice I said earlier today that I like to say that I'm a follower 
of Christ. You, you know why I like to say I'm a follower, not so much even a Christian? It's because when I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to Psalm 139, 23, and 24, when, when, when I let that, those two verses be my life, search me, know my heart, test, point out, and lead, do all those things, when I say I'm a follower, the Holy Spirit will always let me know the parts of my life that I'm not following Jesus in. And I need that. I need that accountability with other people. You do too. But I need it mostly with God. You get over on a lot of people. You ain't never getting over on God. And if you allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you and take you on this journey, He'll not only show you the areas of your life you're not following Him in, but He'll lovingly show you how to restore your life and how to heal you and set you free from everything that's molded you into the person you are today so that you can become God's best version of you tomorrow. Let's worship.